It seems like it's been 40 weeks since you got 40 winks. Your back pain, unbearable. Tossing, turning, trying to find that pain-free position. And that's the moment you realize you can't spend another waking moment putting off treatment. The Joint and Spine Center is Cincinnati's leading destination for spine care with a ton of surgical and non-surgical treatments for back pain. So when a moment has the power to change the rest of your life, go to the one place with the power to change it for the better, the Christ Hospital Health Network. This changes everything. The Pound This Podcast is brought to you by the Christ Hospital Health Network. This is the Pound This Podcast, episode 688, Body Dysmorphia with Dr. Ashley Solomon. I want to lose weight, but I don't know how to get started. What should I meal prep every week? How do I get those sweet booty gains? Inspiration for your healthy lifestyle. The Pound This Podcast with Amanda Valentine. Hey friends, welcome to the Pound This Podcast. I am your host, Amanda Valentine, and I have been obese for most of my life. I'm going to say about six years old or so. Spent well over a decade yo-yo dieting, and then about 10 years ago, I made a New Year's resolution to stop dieting and start making the best decision possible in every moment. And from then, my entire life has changed. I've lost over 100 pounds. I started this podcast at the beginning of 2018 to help other people on their weight loss journeys or their journeys to become healthier people. And I have quit my full-time nine-to-five job, become a certified personal trainer, a certified nutrition coach, and I want to do everything in my power with my own personal journey to help you on yours. So if you're listening to this podcast and you find any value in any episode you listen to, please, please, please share the love, share with family, friends, anyone you think that could find some benefit from this podcast. And you can always reach out to me with any questions or comments you can email me at amanda at amandavalentinebites.com. It's my goal to give you the best information possible for your journey and let you know that you're not alone. I appreciate you listening so much, and I would really appreciate you also sharing the love with this small business entrepreneur (laughs) as I try to make my life's mission helping other people live their best lives. So here we go. Thank you so much for listening to the Poundless Podcast. I am Amanda Valentine. Returning guest is Dr. Ashley Solomon. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me back on. Yes, I was so excited to have you on. So as I will, I'll just let you introduce you, your background. It's been, it's been a while since you've been on the podcast and what you do. So go ahead and give me a, a rundown of your LinkedIn page. <laughs> <laughs> It has been a little while. So I'm Dr. Ashley Solomon. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I own a um, psychotherapy practice and group coaching practice here in Cincinnati. Um, And we really focus on elevating women's impact in the world through strengthening their mental health and wellness. And so we focus on a lot of things, but in particular, um, we do a lot of work with women who are struggling with eating challenges, body image, um, having experienced trauma, uh, postpartum depression, and all of the things that tend to impact us as just women in the world. Yeah. And I will say full disclosure, um, at the beginning of 2020, when you came on the podcast, I'm like, hey, I know I need professional help. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Your girl's got a lot of stuff going on in this dome and um, that I you know, started working with a therapist in your group and I still do. So and she's been amazing and life changing. And so I can, you know, as a testimonial in my Yelp review here that, you know, <laughs> what you're doing uh, is, is amazing. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm very glad that you started what you did because, I mean, that's got to be amazing how impactful you are to so many women in the community. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that it's been helpful for you. I think therapy is truly a gift that we give to ourselves to, to change our lives. So definitely. And I know that, you know, it comes up a lot too, which, I mean, this is a whole nother topic of just, you know, the price and like things of like, people are just so that's a barrier for taking care of your mental health. And it can be like, well, you know, you're like, oh, I can't afford it. But like, but can you afford not to? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Of like, that's something of I feel like uh, I could spend this money on a, a lot of 
just dumb things, entertainment, just crap to own in my house or whatever of like, or can I spend this money investing in me and making sure that I'm living my best life? And I think that people need to view it that way. And, and in my world too, also the, the same view of like, oh, I can't eat healthy. It's so expensive. But like, but mm -hmm. what's, it, there's a cost in there somewhere as you're choosing the cost. Right. I, I think that's such a great perspective. Like we're all, we're always choosing the cost. And, um, and I think that when it comes to the impact on our daily lives, like when we're in a routine of, of just sort of accepting our lives as they are, it can be hard to see. And so even getting a, a perspective on like, what, what are the costs associated with the way that I'm living right now can be really kind of eye-opening and, and helpful and just living a more meaningful life. Definitely. And we have discussed at length, um, binge eating. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. yeah. which I don't feel like they're, the, the, the well is ever dry on that topic. I feel nope. like that affects so many people, but this is a topic up there with binge eating that so many people have asked me about. And in myself, I have lots of questions included uh, about body dysmorphia. And I think specifically from my angle, um, I'm coming at personally, even though I have questions in, in other viewpoints, is the, the thought of, especially after weight loss, um, or especially after a great amount of weight loss like I've had, of, of, mm -hmm. of seeing your body the, the way it is and, and what, what other people, how other people perceive you and how you perceive yourself. And you constantly always see yourself as this version of a person that might not exist anymore. And, yeah. you know, I just feel like there, there's a lot to it. So there's a lot to unpack here. So I, I wanted to just kind of start yeah. with the definition, um, of body dysmorphia and, and what that is for you. And then like what that is clinically when you have like a, a body dysmorphia disorder. Yeah. Yeah, I, I noticed that the, the term body dysmorphia, we use it in a lot of contexts. I mean, it's similar to a lot of other kind of clinical terms that we end up using to describe a lot of different experiences. And, and that's not always a bad thing because sometimes that's the word or the, the words that help us define what we're feeling. But on a clinical level, what body, body dysmorphia is all about is a sort of misperception between what is physically present or true and the kind of image or feeling that we have in our brains about that thing. So usually with, with a body dysmorphia disorder, what we're seeing is someone who has a, a misrepresentation in their mind of what a particular body part looks like. Um, and so that that's one of the kind of differentiators between what we might think of as kind of negative body image and body dysmorphia is that in, in sort of true body dysmorphia, we tend to see it focused on a particular part or area of the body. Um, there's a few that are most common, like our face, our hair, our chest, our stomach. Um, whereas for people that have a more global kind of negative body image, it tends to be more all-encompassing. I just don't feel good about how I look in general. So with body dysmorphic disorder, um, it's, it's very similar actually to an obsessive compulsive disorder. The thoughts are very obsessive. We can't stop thinking about that part of our bodies. And then the compulsive behaviors with body dysmorphic disorder tend to come in the form of trying to change that part of our body, trying to um, obsessively looking in the mirror, um, trying to change it through potentially weight loss efforts or cosmetic surgery or other things because um, we, we can't sort of let that thought lie. Otherwise, it feels like it torments us day in and day out. So how often is that attached to an eating disorder? So a lot of people are surprised to know that, um, you know, a number of people with a good percentage of people with eating disorders will struggle with body dysmorphia, um, but they really are two pretty distinct things. And the majority of people with eating disorders won't have body dysmorphia and the majority of people with body dysmorphia won't have an eating disorder. So they really, that's where sometimes, if, you know, if you're kind of curious to understand 
you know, what, what you might be struggling with, it can take some teasing out by a mental health professional. But um, what we often see is that the, the body dysmorphia and the obsessive sort of thoughts about a particular area of our body might lead us to changing our eating habits um, or in an attempt to um, change that part of our body or just as a way to cope with the stress of that. So we might be engaging in binge eating like we've talked about before um, because that's a way of kind of checking out or coping with how encompassing those like obsessive thoughts about our bodies are. Gotcha. So then what would be the definition for what I think it, most people have personally asked me about then of like, I've lost a significant amount of weight or I have changed my body a certain way and I am visually can't come to grips with that or I still view myself in this certain light, even though in the real world or the, you know, the, the physical world, things look different. So then how is that mm -hmm. categorized? Is that just negative self-image? I think that, so it could be negative self-image. I think it, it, it might depend on what our thoughts, our feelings, like our perceptions are about that change in our bodies. I think the, the way that I think about it, though, for a lot of people who have, you know, significantly reduced their size or their body size has changed, you know, in, in any kind of way, um, is that we, we develop our concept of ourselves in part based on like living in a particular body. And so both in terms of like what it physically feels like to be in the world and what it feels like to sit on a chair or to go on a jog or to, you know, hug someone like we, we develop kind of a, a way uh, that that feels for us. We also develop our self-concept based on just how other people interact with us, which is influenced by the way that we look, and you know, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, but there continues to be a lot of stigma and bias. And so I think of the way that we learned, especially kind of early in our life, um, to feel ourselves in our bodies and to how we expect other people to interact with us based on our bodies. Um, it it forms these, I'm gonna get really neurosciencey for a second, but you know, it forms these neural networks in our brains, like it lays down these patterns in our brains. And so then later in life, maybe our body changes in whatever way. And, but those neural networks haven't necessarily updated to what our new experience is. So we are existing in the world still with a similar brain, but with a different body. And that in and of itself can like kind of create this disconnect where it can feel very strange. I mean, I know that a lot of people that I have worked with talk about how, um, like it, it feels like I just can't update my, my perception of who I am or, um, or I expected to feel better about myself in this different body. And that hasn't necessarily changed. And I just think, I think of it as it's almost two separate processes. Like our, our bodies can change, but for our, sense of ourselves and our perception to change, that's actually kind of a different process. Does that make sense? Yes. I mean, so I guess then my next question is, is how do you work through that process, which I know is a loaded question, but I feel like yeah, that's, yeah, if I, I think you can understand of how yeah. do I change my body and you understand the manipulations that you can make to change what your body looks like or your body size, but then how do you go through that mental change, which is so important? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, I think there's a few parts to that. I think the first part is, and maybe this is the hardest part of it all, I think is working through if, if you have, um, experiences in your life and I don't necessarily just mean specific incidents, but just the experience of kind of existing in the world in a larger body, let's say, you know, my, my standpoint is that people who have existed in the world in a larger body by and large have experienced trauma as a result of that because of the way that the world tends to treat people in different size bodies. Mm -hmm. And so I think 
in addition to or what we what I was saying before about you know those um, those neural pathways that get laid down in our brains, one of those neural pathways. I think often is the insecurity that we develop and the um, the negative self-talk and the negative associations because of existing in a world that tends to be really kind of phobic of different body sizes. So, so I think the first step in a process of kind of healing our brains and healing our, our bodies really is actually um, kind of working through some of that, what I'll call trauma experiences because those live on in our bodies. We can be any size and how other people have treated us or how we felt about ourselves, you know, stays, stays sort of living in our body until we can work it through. So a lot of that work is actually, I I think it works best when it's actually body-based work. Um, Meaning that we are, we're developing practices that show ourselves a lot of kindness. Um, maybe that's, I mean, I'm going to say the like really cliche thing, and maybe that's yoga or maybe that's meditation, but there's a reason that those are, um, those can be so helpful and effective. And they've you know been pretty popular because it's about kind of reconnecting with our body. And so physical practices that help us feel connected in our body I think are also really helpful in kind of bridging that gap between how I feel and how I look, because when we, um, when we do things that feel really painful, for example, when we are, um, you know, doing workouts that like require, they're so like intense or painful that we have to, it's like our brain has to go offline to just get through it we're actually kind of separating ourselves even further from our bodies, like our brains and our bodies, you know, divert Mm -hmm. at that point because we just have to get through this. I have to like numb out just to, to make it through. Whereas something that feels really actually really pleasurable or really good or is like stretching our limits, but not beyond our limits can help us actually feel like more connected with our bodies. So those are, those are some of the sort of ways that we start to bridge that gap. Oh, that makes a ton of sense. And I actually just learned about this because I just had a guest on about a month or so ago where she is certified in, um, yoga for trauma survivors. And I'm like, I didn't know that was a thing. And I'm like, that makes a ton, especially with you saying that, that just like clicks very much of, of getting in tune. And that I want to say, I'm a prophet. This is probably why I'm still dealing with this issue. Cause I don't really like do that. <laughs> I'm bad at those <laughs> things. <laughs> those things. I'm like, Oh, I want to love this. And I'm getting, I'm getting better, but yeah. I feel like it's, you know, or even, I guess then what I have so many questions. I'm trying to filter through what I want to ask first of like, then what is it? Is it the same sort of thing then where it's kind of like, specifically like in a, in a weight loss fashion or whatever you're move or you're working on your body, you, you're getting your body to the, wherever you want it to be and where you mm-hmm. feel like healthy and good. And you know that, and you know, intellectually you're in a better place, but you could still look in the mirror and still be like, Oh, but my stomach is still so gross. And like, but really it's, it's, it's not, but like still in your head, I mean, does that go into the body dysmorphia? Cause then you're just hung on just like, mm-hmm. I still look so fat. I still look so gross, despite the fact that you have done all of these steps to create a different reality and your body does physically look different, but it's still like never, ever good enough. Even if you have like washboard abs and you still think you're fat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know exactly what, you're, what, what you mean. And so it could be in a, in a very clinical sense, it could be uh, like a body dysmorphic disorder in that case, because like one of the things that characterizes BDD um, is that nothing ever sort of satisfies that compulsive need to continue to change. Yeah, um, It doesn't, it never feels good enough. And I think the, the biggest reason for that is because our, you know, perception is distorted for one, we can't like physically are even, there's some really interesting like brain research on like our visual cortex is not giving us an accurate representation of how we look. So how I look compared to how someone else is, you know, seeing my body might be vastly different. Like literally how we're seeing it might be different. Um, it also 
could be, <clears throat> excuse me, it could be that, um, could be a combination too of these things, but it also could be that the, the focus on changing my body has been, this is the, you know, more psychological interpretation, but the focus on changing my body has been, um, given me sort of a sense of purpose, given me a sense of meaning, helped me feel like I have, um, something, you know, sort of to do with my brain and my body and all of these things, it's like become sort of an obsession in and of itself. And so there can often, I see this a lot where can be a fear about saying this is good enough because in a way, what am I going to focus on? Mm, yeah. What am I going to focus on? I don't know what else is important to me, or I know what I would have to focus on, which might be like, my marriage is really shitty or yeah. my, <laughs> my relationship with my parents is really bad or whatever, but it's allowed me to sort of distract my brain um, kind of in this obsessive loop for a long time. And now the thought of kind of maybe moving on or accepting my life in a different way, that actually feels really overwhelming. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, yeah. I, that's yeah, that's something where I think that if you uh, Google body dysmorphia, that's not an answer you're going to get. I feel like it's an answer you need to hear. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Of, right. yeah the, I mean, that's a whole nother topic on its own of how we like disassociate and dra- distract ourselves from our own yeah. problems. Um, yeah. A couple things that like, so... For me personally, you know, because I've been changing my body and, and, and not just, you know, the weight loss thing, but just changing my my health mm-hmm. and my relationship with my body has been yeah. a decade long process for me at this point. And so I still have, you know, days again, and maybe this is just your answer is not connecting to my body. I don't know. I'll let you sure. I'll let you be my therapist here for a moment because I don't feel like I'm alone in this. <laughs> of like. I, I understand more like, you know, my, my body in, in its place in the world and what I'm physically mm-hmm. able to do. And I understand most of the time of just kind of, you know, uh, yeah, I guess how I, I feel in my own body. But then there's still times where I look in the mirror and it feels almost like I've changed nothing from this person I was 10 years ago, mm-hmm. or I will still like to go to get on an airplane and feel like I'm not going to be the fear of like, I'm not going to be able to fit in between the seats yeah. or am I going to go through like a turnstile and am I going to get stuck where it's like most yeah. of the time I understand like, no, you, that that's an issue that you're not dealing with anymore. Cause I used to deal mm-hmm. with those issues, but I'm like, it's 10 years later. Like why uh-huh. has my brain not still made all of those connections yet like updates yeah yeah Yeah. I think um I mean I think it goes back a little bit to to just what I was saying about um you know we call and to get a little sciencey again we we call our feeling of our body in the world like proprioception you know our our sense of you know it's one of our senses we talk about you know taste and smell and those kind of senses but another sense that we don't have to talk about is proprioception which is just sort of how our body um like our perception of our body in space and so like a lot of what i hear you describing is that it feels like your proprioception hasn't sort of updated to um, what your body kind of currently looks like. And I think that that without, you know, overly diagnosing you, Amanda, (laughs) (laughs) I think that that often comes for people through, um, and through a lot of the, like the examples you gave, I think if, if we kind of got into what that would bring up, I imagine that there'd be a lot of fear or shame or embarrassment. Like if you, couldn't fit into a seat or if you got stuck in a turnstile. And so I think for so many people who have um, dealt with those very real realities over the course of their lives, like we've had to be really hyper vigilant about those kind of situations. And so it's sort of calming. So getting to like, what do we do about that? I mean, part of it is about kind of calming our brain down to say, we don't have to be hyper vigilant about that anymore. Like it's, we have to kind of calm our nervous system almost, which is on like high alert kind of existing in the world about like what might happen that could potentially cause me an issue or fear or shame or embarrassment or whatever it might be. And to 
kind of teach ourselves to exist from kind of like a calmer, more regulated place. Um, I think that that's part of it. The part about kind of looking, being able to look in the mirror and still seeing you know, how we felt or how we existed kind of 10 years ago. Um, I think that that sometimes the, the physical, like what we teach people with BDD even is that, and this is hard, that we can't always trust our perception of something. And it's a little unsatisfying because I'd like to say like, we can just like tweak something and you're going to see it more accurately, but it's what we, we know that we don't have great tools to be able to do that, but it's more about teaching, teaching someone that I can remind myself that what I'm seeing in the mirror is likely not accurate to my like current reality. Um, and then to focus on what, um, sort of what my, what's the best thing that I can do for myself right now. So if I look in the mirror and I see someone, um, you know, I feel like I see my body in a larger way than it like physically is, for example, saying to myself, I, I know that that is likely not accurate, um, which is hard because we're, you know, we're taught to like, you know, you need to trust yourself. This is one area I know I'm vulnerable that I'm not going to be able to totally trust my own perception on. And, and then think about what's like the kindest thing I can do for my body right now. It's probably to accept it, to like continue with whatever plan I'm on to like do the things that like treat it well. Um, I don't need to respond to that thought because that's my brain giving me like warning signals, but it's over firing. I can't totally trust it right now. I need to go back to what I know is my plan. And I, oh, I feel like I'm just to hop off of that then. Yeah. Cause then I feel like you can sometimes get into a loop. At least I do personally of like, well, how do I, will I ever accurately have a, a an accurate perception of myself? Like, how do I know? And I guess that, I guess then it goes into leading into what others perceive you as. So then what is it? Uh -huh. matter I guess it just is how I choose to perceive me is the only thing that matters I would assume but then you you drag mm -hmm. other people into this of like well I want to see I see myself looking like this but is that how everybody else sees me or is my perception of this wrong and I, I don't know I feel like I kind of just get in loops of like because I can't trust my own perception so then mm -hmm. I don't know my space in the world um, I guess mm -hmm. for myself because I don't know. I don't know where I'm fitting because I can't see mm -hmm. like some like where it's like one day you feel awesome about yourself and the next day you hate yourself. And I think it's just then you're like, well, where's the middle ground and who am I really and how am I really showing up? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what is this body looking like with how I'm showing up and how am I being perceived? And can I ever, mm -hmm. you know, if people are like, oh, my God, you look so amazing. And then you just immediately be like you're just saying that to be nice. You know what I mean? Of like, well, that that's not true because you listen, I can see myself and I can see that you're bullshitting me to make me feel better. And uh -huh. it's like, I know, I know we're going into another like dark area of the brain here, but it feels like, I don't know. That's at least the traps I get, I get hung up on. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, but I, I realize I'm doing it, but at the same time, I feel like I can't unwind it because I can't get an accurate representation of again, like where, Mm -hmm. of the, of the, my own perception of myself, if that all makes sense. Right. Right. So what I, what I would actually say, and I, this might be a little unpopular to say <laughs> is that I think part of what I'm hearing in, in you describing your experience is that, um, like your mood and your feelings about yourself end up getting very tied to what the perception is. So like when you were, when you were saying, you know, how I'm not going to quote you exactly correctly, but um, essentially like, I'm not sure how to feel about myself yeah. because I don't know if I can trust my own perception or trust other people's perceptions, you know, are they like bullshitting me or whatever? What I would actually say is that it's part of this work is about separating my, my feelings about myself from my physical appearance, whether that's my own perception of it, other people's perception of it, um, that I'm trying to, and this is, I mean, I'm making it sound 
probably much more <laughs> simple and straightforward than it is because this is incredibly difficult. Um, but to kind of divorce those two things from each other so that I am not experiencing whether it's my self-worth or even just like how good I feel in my body um, based on what someone else's perception or even my own perception is. So starting like for myself, that work has been through, you know, for myself, I think that I've tried and by no means I'm perfect with this, but tried to notice that my automatic instinct is going to be like, you know, how good do I look in this Zoom video or um, what are other people's sort of perceptions? You know, what are they going to think about how this looks? Um, and recognizing that that's probably always going to be like my immediate like instinct, but I can follow that up by trying to refocus my energy and attention on, but how do I actually like feel in my body today? Like, am I tired? Am I energized? Do I feel like connected to myself or do I feel like kind of dissociated from myself? Like, you know, am I hungry? Like what are all, there's so many perceptual experiences of our bodies outside of like the visual mm -hmm. um, that for me, it can be helpful to try to focus on some of those other ones um, to separate myself from that. But I think just going back to, I think the original part of your question, which was like, does this change ever? Like, yeah. does it ever become like more aligned? I, my honest answer is I think that it's highly, I think it's highly variable. I think for some people, it really does sort of the longer that we maybe live in a different body, you know, our brain has a chance to kind of update with that. We start to experience the world differently. Um, we're doing some of that work to like, kind of regulate our reactions to things. Um, and for, for, and for other people, honestly, like it always sort of feels like this, a little bit of a disconnect, but I sort of learned that I, I can't always trust my perception and I try to focus on, you know, other, other cues of like who I am or how I look even. Um, it can be really helpful to have, like, if you can find, if, if you're able to have like a trusted person, like partner, friend who can say like, yeah, that really doesn't look great on you or, um, or yeah, you actually look awesome in that. It can be hard when you struggle with something like BDD or, you know, just even like low self-worth to, to believe someone else. But sometimes we can find like that one person that we know is going to like give it to us straight. And that can be like a good check, check and balance for ourselves too sometimes. Yeah. I think for me to, I guess, just kind of self diagnose myself here of why, you know, thinking about it a decade in still struggling with this is that, you know, I was in this overweight body, not that even it mattered that I was overweight for, uh -huh. you know, 30 years of my life. And because my body was such a, in a way I lived in the world and because of other people's perceptions of just, you know, even yeah. as a kid, that's what I got made fun of for. And that's what, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't dating for. And then, you know, my mom is like, join the volleyball team. So you lose weight. And like everything was around my size and what I look like. And then especially, you know, then going into a career in media, then it's, it's definitely that. So I just feel like it's been so much conditioning of like, Yes. What you, what I look like tied to my worth, tied to how I show up in the world. So even 10 years of trying to untangle yeah. those knots, it's, it's going to be a longer process. And that's where I'm like, I, I'm working so hard personally right now. I'm just on self-love of really loving myself, despite what my body mm -hmm. looks like or how other people perceive my body and just to be healthy and not worried about, you know, all the other things that come with being, you know, judged on your body. And it's, it's so freaking mm -hmm. hard because that's just how people are. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's like, and especially I think that if you're in that same environment of like, you're working on change and you're still in the same environment where people are harshly judging your body or making comments about your body, or that is what people are tying your worth to, then how do you even undo that? And when you're like still living in that same situation, Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, I would share that I, um, I was a larger bodied kid and was 
you know, considered overweight until maybe I was, you know, 15 or 16 years old. So I'm much older than that now. And, um, but just sharing that is, you know, it wasn't even 30 years for me. It was probably like 10 from the time I was like five to 15, but, you know, couldn't, couldn't fit into the clothes that my friends wore, like all of those things that go along with like being a, a larger kid. And, you know, it was, yeah, very like not physically active um, and always felt a lot of shame around that. And long story short, I mean, those, if someone will comment on my body today and describe me as smaller or something like that still doesn't feel like it matches yeah. my reality. And that's, you know, I, I was like truly a child um, and have not lived as like an adult as, um, you know, in a larger body. And yet, so, I mean, just to to share like my personal example, like it, it, there still feels like there's a disconnect to some degree. I mean, it's not pervasive for me at this point. Um, You know, I feel like I have a generally an accurate representation of like what my body size is, but I just think that especially when we have experienced like our youth in a larger body, like that's such a prime time for all these, again, these like foundations to be laid about like how we, Cause we're just starting at that point to figure out like, how does the world perceive people like me? What is, you know, what, it, what do bodies mean? Like all of our foundational understandings of those things and who we are and our identity is getting shaped right at that time. And our brains are like so malleable to like getting shaped around those things that, that I think in a way, I mean, our brains can change throughout our lives. That's the good news. They can continue to update, but that's just, that's hard to contend with when like during such this vulnerable time, you experience the world like that. So I say that mostly like, I hope all of us like give ourselves a lot of grace around that. Even if we're like, I've been at this forever and it just still feels so hard. I mean, I, I get that. There's a reason it feels so hard. Yeah. I think it's such an important part of it. Like where you're hearing other people's voices, I think uh, of from the past rather than your own, like, you know, just even, yeah. and how much those just like, I mean, you're not going to be able to change other people's comments, um, but just how you, how you view them or, you know, like an example for me is when I was a kid, I was maybe like mm, 12 or so, somewhere around there. What my breast, my best friend's mom said, you would be so pretty if you just lost weight. Mm-hmm. And so then it's like forever of like, well, if I'm a smaller person, if this body, then I'll be pretty. I'm not pretty now. Like obviously being overweight equals not pretty to uh-huh. this person yeah, who's an important the, person yeah, in my life. Like very clear message. Yeah. And so then yeah. it's like hung up on that. And even if, you know, for, for me changing my body, well, then is it, well, is it ever small enough to be pretty? I must not be pretty, you know, and not that that one comment is just drilling holes into my brain, but I think it's just a a lot of those things kind of bury themselves subconsciously of like, then you kind of pull back into that of like, then, then that's where you get obsessive over it of like, well, well, when will I be pretty? Is my body small enough yet? Is this, you know, this is obviously how the whole world perceives me because this is how one person perceived me and it's just becomes a nightmare. (laughs) Totally. Well, and if you think about it as like, you know, you're a 12 year old and this is a person who like is a grown up and is somebody that you probably, you know, knows you pretty well and is a, you know, friend's mom, like that kind of becomes the representation of the world. Like that's the, okay. I like internalize that belief. I like file it away. Even like you said, not necessarily consciously, like you're thinking about it all the time, but it just sort of imprints on your brain and like, it's, yeah, it's hard to unlearn that and sort of back that up, yeah, especially that early on. So I guess from a, a different perspective of this topic that I feel like I have experienced a little bit in the past, but weirdly I've been seeing so many TikTok videos on this mm-hmm. of kind of the opposite of not that I have made my body smaller or, or have made improvements that I'm like, I want my body to look this way and I've worked on blah, blah, blah to get it whatever that way. And now I still can't see myself where I've been seeing a lot on TikTok of like, Hey, I'm really feeling myself. I feel like I'm a hot babe and you're going through the world with confidence. And then you catch a mirror and you're like, Oh no, wow. I'm really been lying to myself. And, and in my own perception, 
I haven't felt specifically that way, but even thinking before of like, oh, I feel like I'm an average size. I don't feel like I'm quote unquote that big. You know what I mean? Of like, I just feel like I'm just the size of everyone else. And then catching myself like a reflection, like an example I had was Uh um, I used to work at, at Subway and mm-hmm. I had that perception of my own body of like, yeah, I'm just average. And then I sat in a booth and I could see myself in the reflection of the window and I could see uh-huh. like my stomach hanging over the table of the booth, which I wasn't uh-huh. even really feeling. And I just looked at that. And I'm like, am I, is that what I really look like? Is that uh-huh. how everyone else sees me? Because I, that is, that is a much larger person than I see in my, in my own head. And then I feel like you almost make up a way to start torturing yourself. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so is that the same the same thing or is that a different version of this? That's a good question. I I think it's I think it's a little bit different. Um but I in a way it might be slightly easier to cope with and that you know I'm saying this like both seriously and like sarcastically that like at least we can just avoid mirrors to some degree like if that's going to make you feel like crap you know if you're if you're sort of fortunate enough to be walking around the world feeling like I am you know I have my shit together and I'm feeling really good and I love what I'm wearing and you know I would say uh, as much as you can avoid the things that are gonna disrupt that experience for you you know whether that's a you know, shitty person or a mirror or whatever. We of course can't avoid every like reflective surface that we come across. Um, but I think it, it's, it more so like, I think it kind of speaks to, or gives us this insight into our, our self perception doesn't have to match that like physical reflection and that there is like a way to it's possible to feel really good and comfortable in ourselves, um, regardless of what that like reflection sort of shows us. So, um, I think in a way there's some like positivity to that. Um, I think it's, maybe it's about not allowing those experiences. And this is where, you know, things like therapy or good body image practices come in handy, not letting them, those experiences go and like completely alter what my, like positive mental state was before I saw that, you know, and I go back to like, wait a second, a minute ago, I was feeling great. And am I going to let like, you know, this reflective surface totally demolish that? Or can I kind of like come back into myself and know like nothing has changed. Nothing has changed in this last minute other than maybe like my negative self-talk that just happened. And so can I like sort of revise that? Yeah, it just seems like that's the best way to go through life of like, yeah, if you're feeling good and confident, like especially seeing all these TikTok videos of women, I'm like, yeah, yeah man, like that's the vibe I want to be. And then what does it matter how the rest of the world perceives your body? If you're feeling it yeah. and you're putting that out there, then that's your reality mm-hmm. then. So it just, I feel like that's a bummer to, I mean, you know, mm-hmm. being guilty of this myself to like stop that because of like, oh, well, just because I'm feeling it, someone else is going to think I'm too fat or too big or too mm-hmm. ugly or my hair doesn't look right or I have glasses or whatever other thing somebody's yeah. going to find it to attack you on of like, yeah, I'm just, man, just go through life feeling that way. And what does it matter if somebody, like, not yeah. everybody's going to like you? Like that sounds like someone else's problem, not yours, but again, <laughs> easier said than done. <laughs> It makes me think a little bit about, um, you know, I having my like last baby and like my weight and body, I mean, your obviously body changes through like pregnancy and all of that. And, you know, after each pregnancy, I was still sort of generally able to wear similar clothes, but after the last one that was not happening and I went up a few sizes and, um, and just in a similar way, I'd be like, why does this feel like why is this affecting me so much at the end of the day, like a number or a letter, whatever it is in terms of a size, like it's a momentary thing that I'm seeing. Why am I sort of allowing that momentary? I mean, I feel pretty much the same in my body. I can do all the things that I, you know, did before. Why am I letting like that momentary perception of something like totally dictate how I, you know, feel about myself and, you know, and, 
and that's it, trying to balance it between like, I understand why it's so like I shared before, I have a lot of trauma from experiencing, um, you know, life in a larger body as a kid. And like those like fears still like live in me as much as, as much work as I've done. And like, we still live in a society that's going to like, maybe look at me a little bit differently, but at the end of the day, like I feel exactly the same. And so I have to like, keep coming back to that. Like I'm the same person. I'm the same, you know, um, I can do all the same things like this does not need to define like how I go about my day. Yeah. So if, if somebody is listening to this and they're kind of struggling, like what would your best recommendation be? Like how could, could they reach out to you, ask you a question? Can, I mean, do you have uh, sure, some resources? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a pretty active Instagram account and we like, I love to talk about this kind of stuff there. So that's at Gallia Collaborative. Um, I am always happy to um, direct people to resources too. We were talking about this a little bit before we started that if you know, if you want to find a therapist in your area and you just don't know where to start, I love helping people find um, good resources wherever you are. So feel free to reach out. Um, my website's galliacollaborative.com and there's a contact form and all that good stuff there. Well, awesome. I mean, I feel like this was helpful of just, yeah, by kind of working through these issues. And I definitely think that I mean, I'm sure you talk to more people than I do, but I, I don't think that we're, we're most people are alone in this. I feel like a lot no, of us feel this way. Not. And again, you're doing just such amazing things, and I highly recommend anybody yeah. uh, reaching out to you or Galia Collaborative or anybody there to you know to to dig into this further, since everybody has their own experience. And um, I always just appreciate so much when you come on this podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Yes. I always love being here. Well, thank you. For info on health coaching and more. Go to AmandaValentineBites.com.